Today's video is brought to you by Magic the Gathering's The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. It's the biggest magic release of all time set in the greatest fantasy world of all time. And now is the perfect time to dive in. Join the fellowship with The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth on sale now. It's a bitter rivalry whose history stretches throughout the ages of Middle-Earth. The animosity and aggression of these two races stretches from the earliest days of the world to the latest. But why does this hatred come about? Who started this feud? Or rather, feuds? Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the history of the hatred between elves and dwarves. Of all the influential aspects of Tolkien's tales, there is perhaps none that show up as often as the rivalry between elves and dwarves. It has become a staple of countless fantasy media, great and small. While Tolkien's first published examples of this animosity would come in the pages of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, we find they are but a distant echo of the events that formed these bitter feelings. Those were happier days, when there was still close friendship at times between folk of different race even between dwarves and elves. It was not the fault of the dwarves that the friendship waned, said Gimli. I have not heard that it was the fault of the elves, said Legolas. I have heard both, said Gandalf, and I will not give judgment now, but I beg you two, Legolas and Gimli, at least to be friends and to help me. Today, as we look at the entire history of this relationship, we will find that not all these feelings and events are connected to one another. But before we chronicle the list of grievances and alliances, we must first note that the strife between these two races was foretold by Iluvatar himself. For after Aule created the dwarves in secret, in his mercy Eru gave them life, but he said, They shall sleep now in the darkness under stone, and shall not come forth until the firstborn have awakened upon the earth. And until that time thou and they shall wait, though long it seem. But when the time comes, I will awaken them, and they shall be to thee as children, and often strife shall arise between thine and mine, the children of my adoption and the children of my choice. The first instance of dwarves and elves meeting comes in the ancient days, when the Sindarin elves of Beleriand would first encounter the petty dwarves. These dwarves were known for their particularly small stature, for they were a diminutive race, descended from exiles of the other dwarf kingdoms. These dwarves settle in the moorlands between the rivers Narog and Sirion, as well as in the caverns along the Narog itself. During these early days of Middle-earth, taking place in the years of the trees, the elves happen upon the petty dwarves, and do not recognize them to be incarnate beings for they seldom caught sight of them in clear light. In the Silmarillion, we are told the elves of Beleriand knew not what these creatures were, and they hunted them and slew them, referring to them as two-legged animals. However, after the elves would meet the dwarves of the Blue Mountains, they would realize that these creatures were indeed smaller dwarves. From then on, the elves would leave them alone, and they called them Nuiguth Nibin, the petty dwarves. While this would seem to indicate the elves were the first to wrong the other, it's worth noting that in the History of Middle-earth Volume 11, The War of Jewels, it states that the Eldar become aware of the petty dwarves' existence when they attack the elves by stealth at night. For their part, the petty dwarves would harbor the deepest hatred of the elves in all the history of their kind for it is said that they hated the Eldar no less than they hated orcs. But even greater than their hatred of the Sindar who had hunted them was their hatred of the Noldor, the exiles of Valinor who would come to Middle-earth at the dawn of the First Age. Among these exiles is Finrod, the brother of Galadriel, who eventually comes to the caverns of Narog. By this time, the petty dwarves have abandoned their caverns, for they had been hunted to near extinction by the elves before the Eldar realized their mistake. Finrod sets to building a new elvish realm within the caverns in 52 of the First Age, and at first he is aided by the petty dwarves who still lingered there. The dwarves are greatly compensated, 
However, their chieftain, Mim, attempts to murder Finrod in his sleep. The attempt fails, and Mim and his petty dwarves are expelled. Mim would go on to become the last surviving member of his kind, and bring about further dark deeds in the tale of the Children of Húrin. Finrod would later be aided by another group of dwarves, those of the Blue Mountains. Despite the initial hunting of the petty dwarves, the dwarves of Nagrod and Belagost do not appear to harbor an ill will for this deed, for it is said that the great dwarves despise the petty dwarves. Indeed, as we'll see throughout the history of elves and dwarves, the clan any given elf or dwarf belongs to will make a difference on how they feel toward the other race. Thus, the dwarves of the Blue Mountains assist Finrod, completing his new realm of Nargothrond in 102 of the First Age. They give Finrod the name Felagund, meaning Hewer of Caves, and make for him the Nauglamir, the Necklace of the Dwarves. This necklace combined the craft and skill of the dwarves with beautiful gems Finrod had brought from Valinor. It is said to have been Finrod's most prized treasure, and the most famous dwarven work of the Elder Days. We will also see the dwarves of the Blue Mountains ally with the sons of Feanor. Led by their lord, Azagal, the dwarves of Belagost would march in the Great Alliance to make war upon Morgoth in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears in 472. In the end, the alliance is defeated, Azagal is slain, and the surviving dwarves and elves retreat as Morgoth takes control of the north. The next grievous event in this long history of dwarves and elves begins in 502, 30 years after the Nirnaeth Arnoediad. By this time, Finrod is long dead, Nargothrond had recently been destroyed, and King Thingol of Doriath has come into possession of Finrod's Nauglamir. Thingol desires to combine the Nauglamir with his other great treasure, a Silmaril, which Baron and Luthien had stolen from Morgoth's crown. Thus, Thingol hires dwarves from Nagrod to combine the two great pieces, the greatest of the dwarves and the greatest of the elves. However, by the time the dwarves completed the task, they had become obsessed with the necklace, and in exchange for their labor, they demand Thingol give them the work itself, saying, By what right does the elven king lay claim to the Nauglamir? that was made by our fathers for Finrod Felagund, who is dead. It has come to him by the hand of Húrin, the man of Dorlomin, who took it as a thief out of the darkness of Nargothrond. But Thingol perceived their hearts, and saw well that desiring the Silmaril, they sought but a pretext and fair cloak for their true intent. And in his wrath and pride he gave no heed to his peril, but spoke to them in scorn, saying, how do ye of uncouth race dare to demand aught of me, Elu Thingol, Lord of Beleriand, whose life began by the waters of Quivian and years uncounted ere the fathers of the stunted people awoke? And standing tall and proud among them, he bade them with shameful words be gone, unrequited out of Doriath. Then the lust of the dwarves was kindled to a rage by the words of the king and they rose up about him and laid hands on him, and slew him as he stood. So died in the deep places of Menegroth, Elwe Singolo, king of Doriath, who alone of all the children of Iluvatar was joined with one of the Ainur, and he who, alone of the forsaken elves, had seen the light of the trees of Valinor, with his last sight gazed upon the Silmaril. The dwarves flee with the Nauglamir, but are pursued to the death in Doriath as they sought the eastward road. Only two dwarves survive, making their way back to Nagrod as the Nauglamir is brought back to Queen Melian. It is said the dwarves told somewhat of all that had befallen, saying the dwarves were slain in Doriath by command of Thingol, who would cheat them of their reward. The dwarves of Nagrod thought long of their vengeance, and even asked for the aid of the dwarves of Belagost. However, the dwarves of Belagost refused, and instead tried to dissuade their kin from this purpose. However, their counsel is ignored, and a great host comes from Nagrod to Doriath. After the death of her husband, Queen Melian had returned to Valinor. Thus, her protective magic upon the realm was gone. 
The dwarves come to Menegroth itself, and while both sides suffer heavy losses, the dwarves plundered the halls and made off with many treasures, including the Nauglamir. However, word would come to Baron and Luthien at Tol Galen, telling of what had befallen in Doriath. Baron leads a group of green elves in ambushing the dwarves near Sarn Athrad, with the remaining dwarves being destroyed by Ents near Mount Dolmid. The Nauglamir would be taken by Baron to be worn by Luthien, and while it would factor heavily into elven kinslayings, it would play no further role in the tale of elves and dwarves. However, these events between the dwarves of Nagrod and the Sindarin elves would not soon be forgotten for some of the greatest elves of the Third Age would have been among those of Thingol's kingdom, and long would they remember the dwarves who killed their king and sacked their capital. But next we must turn to the Second Age, where we actually find the greatest friendship between these two races to ever exist. After the destruction of Beleriand, both elves and dwarves alike would travel east to the lands of Eriador and beyond. The surviving dwarves of Nagrod and Belagost would come to live in Khazad-dûm in the Misty Mountains, where their remnants would join the already thriving society of the Longbeards, also known as Durin's Folk. In 750 of the Second Age, a group of Noldoran elves would found the realm of Aregion near Khazad-dûm, having been drawn there by the Mithril of the dwarves. The elves and dwarves begin an unprecedented friendship between their two races no doubt in part for their shared love of smithing and crafting. They trade freely with one another, and a road runs directly from the elven capital of Austin Ethil to Khazad-dûm. The jewel smith Celebrimbor develops a personal friendship with the dwarf Narvi, and together they create the famed Doors of Durin. So great was the friendship between their races that in one version of the tale, Celebrimbor gives Durin III a ring of power directly, rather than it being given by Sauron. As Sauron's war upon the elves draws near, Galadriel, her daughter Celebrian, and many other elves of Eregion are given passage through Khazad-dûm to seek safety in Lorien. And when Sauron's forces sack and destroy Eregion itself, the dwarves launch a surprise attack on the Dark Lord aiding a cornered Elrond who had come to Eregion's aid. In the later War of the Last Alliance, we are told some dwarves of Moria joined the host of elves and men, while other dwarves, presumably from the clans in the Far East, fought on the side of Sauron. After Sauron's fall, the dwarves of Khazad-dûm and the elves of Lorien would presumably live in peace with one another, perhaps not in great friendship as with Eregion, but there is no recorded hostility. That would all change roughly two-thirds of the way through the Third Age. For in 1980, after centuries of greedily mining for Mithril, the dwarves awaken a Balrog, which had long slept in the depths of the Misty Mountains. By 1981, the dwarves are forced to flee from Khazad-dûm, which is now known far and wide as Moria, the Black Pit. At this time, many of the Galathrim flee south out of Lorien, among them is Amroth, their king, who would die in the Bay of Belphalas. As we will come to see centuries later, the elves of Lorien would not forget that the dwarves had awakened this ancient malice. However, the next relationship between elves and dwarves we encounter is when Bilbo goes with Thorin's company to Rivendell. While the elves of Rivendell tease Thorin and the company as Gandalf leads them into the valley, Elrond is quite hospitable to the group. While the text mentions he does not altogether approve of dwarves and their love of gold, he welcomes the group as they rest in Rivendell for two weeks and helps them to read their map. It's possible that, despite Elrond being descended from Thingol himself, he remembers the dwarves of Durin's folk saving his forces from the destruction of Sauron thousands of years earlier. The dwarves' two-week stay in Rivendell would certainly be more hospitable than their nearly month-long stay in the Woodland Realm. After becoming lost, they stumble upon an elven feast three times, and are attacked by spiders before being captured by Thranduil's elves. They are kept prisoner in Mirkwood after refusing to reveal their purpose. It's worth noting that in the Hobbit book, Thranduil seems to have less of an outright hatred and a hostility toward the dwarves than in the film adaptations. He's certainly interested in getting some of the riches within the mountain for himself, but unlike Bard, he doesn't necessarily want to attack the dwarves over gold. 
That being said, it's worth noting that the depths of the conflict between these races was not fleshed out when The Hobbit was published. Otherwise, it's possible we might indeed have seen more open hostility from Thranduil. Though I suppose a month-long incarceration is arguably pretty hostile. Thranduil and his father had lived in Doriath before it was destroyed in the Second Kinslaying, and quite possibly lived through the events that saw the dwarves of Nagrod kill the king and sack Menegroth. We even find that Thranduil's own woodland realm is built in much the same manner as Menegroth before it, so the connection to those previous events is pretty strong. While it's true the dwarves of Khazad-dûm were not of the same clan as those who sacked Menegroth, we can see in another famous elf of the Third Age their ability to hold a deep grudge. For Celeborn, the husband of Galadriel, is also of the Sindar. And unlike Thranduil, he was not merely a resident of Doriath, but was the grand-nephew of King Thingol himself. But would he hold a grudge against Durin's folk when it was the dwarves of Nagrod who wronged them? In Unfinished Tales, we see the answer as it talks of Celeborn. Celeborn had no liking for dwarves of any race, as he showed to Gimli in Lothlorien, and never forgave them for their part in the destruction of Doriath. However, his wife is of the Noldor, and looks upon the dwarves of Khazad-dûm in an entirely different way. She looked upon the dwarves also with the eye of a commander, seeing in them the finest warriors to pit against the orcs. Moreover, Galadriel was a Noldo, and she had a natural sympathy with their minds and their passionate love of crafts of hand, sympathy much greater than that found among many of the Eldar. The dwarves were the children of Aule, and Galadriel, like others of the Noldor, had been a pupil of Aule and Yavanna in Valinor. In this, we see part of the reasoning that Galadriel and Celebrian fled through Khazad-dûm to Lorien in the Second Age, while Celeborn remained behind in Eregion. And in later days, while Galadriel had the wisdom to see all free folk of Middle-earth must play a part in the defeat of Sauron, Celeborn, we see, is less quick to accept a dwarf into his company giving perhaps the coldest welcome of all the elf lords mentioned here. Not only is Gimli, and as a result the entire fellowship, made to be blindfolded in order to enter Lorien, but Celeborn then laments that he allowed entry of the entire group because a dwarf is among them. Alas, said Celeborn, we have long feared that under Caratras a terror slept. But had I known that the dwarves had stirred up this evil in Moria again, I would have forbidden you to pass the northern borders. You and all that went with you. So not only is Celeborn bitter due to the events of the Nagrod Dwarves 6,000 years earlier, but he also carries an enmity from the dwarves waking the Balrog in Khazad-dûm. For her part, Galadriel calls Celeborn's words to Gimli rash, pointing out that he should not repent of his welcome. Celeborn admits he spoke in the trouble of his heart, asking Gimli to forget his harsh words, and pledges to aid the company. In the story of the Lord of the Rings, we see impactful moments that show the ability of these two races to respect one another and thrive together. As we know, Gimli's parting gift from Galadriel would be three strands of her hair when he had asked for one. This would be both shocking and symbolic for a dwarf to receive this gift, when Feanor, among the very greatest of the elves in ancient days, would be refused a single strand three times. And by the time this story comes back to Legolas and Gimli themselves, we see a wide history spanning well over 6,000 years. And no doubt there are remnants of the ancient grudge over the sacking of Doriath. And a bit more recently, the fact that Glowin and his friends were held prisoner for a month by Thranduil. Yet Legolas and Gimli would indeed become friends as Gandalf had suggested, with a brotherhood forged through adventure and war. In the Fourth Age, after Sauron's defeat, they would once again show the greatness these two races could achieve when old hatreds are set aside and forgotten. I always love diving into Tolkien's world, whether it's in the pages of the books themselves or through adaptations. And Magic the Gathering's The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-earth is a great new way to experience this amazing fantasy world. Whether you're an experienced magic player or a newbie like me, there's tons of fun to be had, whether you like to play, collect, or both. There are tons of incredible cards featuring artwork by an amazing lineup of artists, with more on the way. Alternate versions are now available for pre-order featuring the Ralph Bakshi film 
and the iconic illustrations of the Brothers Hildebrand. The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth is available now wherever magic is sold. Check out the link in the description to learn more and order packs of The Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark-Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.